Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article says, stamp out this hate speech manufacturing network. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. Recently, we have the Supreme Court of India, which was hearing to one of the cases. This was with respect to one of the political party's spokespersons who had made unkind remarks on a TV show. It held that this person was single-handedly responsible for causing trouble in the country. That was because there was a vitiating environment. There was a lot of violence in multiple states as well. And as a result, we have the Supreme Court of India, which went on to say that this spokesperson from one of the political parties was solely responsible for causing trouble in the country. The minute this statement was made by the judges of the Supreme Court, this triggered a massive storm on the social media with number of people launching a vitriolic attack on the two judges. It is in this particular backdrop we have Justice Pardiwala who called for the regulation of the social media. So this article here is primarily speaking about two important paradigms. One is about the social media regulation. The other is about Supreme Court's oral observation. We will try and understand what is this social media regulation all about. We will also try and understand what is the Supreme Court's oral observation. Is it overreach or not? First, we will understand what is this social media regulation. When we speak about the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is the last ray of hope. So what exactly happens? There should be no interference to the Supreme Court, whether it is from the legislature, whether it is from the executive or from any other institutes or even from the media or from the people as well. But what is happening off late? Whenever there is a Supreme Court observation made by the judges, there are a number of people who are not happy with this particular observation. They go on the social media and they make vitriolic remarks on these judges as well. So the trial on the digital media is causing interference for the judiciary is the first part of the article. So basically we have Justice Pardiwala who expressed apprehension that personal attacks on judges for their judgments could lead to a dangerous situation where the judges have to think about what social media thinks instead of what the law really thinks. So this basically means that there are attacks that are happening on the judges and as a result, this institution of judiciary will not be able to serve justice because the judges will be shaken because these judges are part of the society and when the society threatens indirectly, they would not be able to do justice to that particular case. So whenever we hear about a case, what exactly happens? There is already the media trial that is taking place. What the media wants is sensationalization. What the media wants is the TRP. So they may take a particular statement and they may create an apprehension and a sensation on the platforms. So the social media which is looking into this so media sensation immediately starts judging the judges who are supposed to give what is right according to the law. So instead of these judges who have to base their arguments, give the judgment on the basis of what law points out they would not be able to do so because there is already a vitiating environment. The social media has already come to a particular judgment and they believe that the judgment should be in that particular favor. In case the judgment is not according to its own favor as projected by the media and the social media, then there is vitriolic remarks attacks on the judges. So this means there is indirect interference with the administration of the justice and they won't be able to do justice is the first major criticism. So if there are judges who have to look into the law and ultimately pass a judgment, but there are social media people, there are number of individuals who are criticizing the judge, not on the basis of the judgment, but are making personal remarks. They are threatening them. In that particular case, the judges may feel apprehensive and in the near future, this institution of the judiciary may be shaken is the first major criticism. So this article currently goes on to say that constructive and critical appraisal of all the judges are permitted in the democracy but when it comes to the personalized attacks on judges they are harming the judicial institution and also lowering their dignity. 
this is not the first time that a Supreme Court judge has made such a remark that we need to regulate the social media. In the past as well, we have the Chief Justice of India, N. V. Ramana, who also stressed that it was imperative to start a discourse on how social media trends could affect the institutions. So he went on to express that there is the need to protect the judiciary from the motivated and targeted social media attacks. In fact, he also asked the law enforcement agencies as well to deal with them in order to create a secure environment to let all judicial officers work effectively. So what do we understand from this? That social media is indirectly interfering with the administration of the justice and as a result, these judges who have to base their arguments, who have to give their judgments on the basis of evidence, documents, oral submissions that are made are not able to do it but are pressurized by the media trial as well as by the social media. In the past as well, former Chief Justice of India Sharat Arvind Bobre has also spoken openly about the judicial harassment online where he said judges' reputations are getting torn apart under the guise of the freedom of speech. So this kind of judicial condemnation is a new feature of the social media and Justice Bobre himself admitted that it is very difficult to regulate. So how should the social media be regulated? So the first part of the article is about social media regulation. How how should this be regulated? Social media is part of the society. One needs to have a balance between how one behaves on the social media. We have to take two important parameters. What is this parameter? One, we have to understand if it is a bona fide criticism of the judgments, then it is a fair one. If it is about exercising the freedom of speech and expression in a fair manner, it is good as well. It is on the public interest as well. What do we mean by it? It means that we have the Supreme Court of India, which has passed one of the judgments. This judgment is not meeting the intended standards. In that case, you can go ahead and criticize the judgment where if fair trial is not conducted. But if you are personally attacking the judges, if you are calling for the genocide, if you are calling for the violence, in that case, it is not acceptable. So if it is the right criticism of the judgment, if it is about justice, you can go ahead and criticize it even on the social media because that is in line with the freedom of speech and expression. But if you are calling for subversion of the justice, if you are calling for violence, if you are calling for genocide in the society, it means the justice will not be served and for such people because it is a malicious criticism this will have to be taken seriously by the law enforcement agencies another important recommendation that was given in the past by the Supreme Court of India in one of the landmark judgments of the Sahara case is what is called as the doctrine of postponement of public issue what do we mean by it according to this principle as given by the Supreme Court of India it asks the media to put up a precautionary note. What is this precautionary note? What happens in the media? Whenever there is a case that is being investigated in the Supreme Court or in the High Court, we have the media which can sensationalize the issue. This particular issue is currently being heard in the High Court or in the Supreme Court of India. But the media does not take into the entire proceedings. It does not look into the entire observation made by the Supreme Court or the High Court. But it cherry picks what it wants so that it can get its TRP and sensationalize. So it is already being heard by the Supreme Court or the High Court. So it is sub judice in nature as well. So the Supreme Court, according to the doctrine of postponement of public issue, goes on to say that the media should be restricted to publish opinions when a matter is in the Supreme Court. So until the trial is concluded, so when the judgment is passed, the media should be able to give whatever it wants to. But during the proceedings, when it is in sub judice, it should hold on to some restraint, says the Supreme Court of India. If this is done, the media will not be reported or sensationalizing an issue and this ultimately means that social media will also not go about criticizing the Supreme Court. So if it is the genuine criticism, it is good. If it is fair and good criticism, it is good. But if it is about call for violence or threatening the judges, this is not the right go. So in such a case, the social media has to be regulated. In such a case, whoever threatens, they need to be penalized and put behind bars by the law enforcement agency. So the Supreme Court says that this should be the way forward 
and the media should be imposed with what is called as doctrine of postponement of public issue. The second important issue with respect to this article is Supreme Court's oral observations where the comments that were made by the Supreme Court with respect to this spokesperson of a political party, is it right or wrong? Before we understand what this is, we have to understand some basics. We have one of the words called as the ratio decidendi. We also have another word called as obiter dicta. What do we understand by ratio decidendi? When we speak about ratio decidendi, it basically stands for reasons for the decision. We have the Supreme Court of India. The Supreme Court has two important parameters whenever it is making a judgment. One is the written judgment which is given by the Supreme Court of India. Then what we also have is the oral observation that is given by the Supreme Court of India. So whatever is written and the very foundation on which the Supreme Court derive its judgments is what is called as ratio decidendi. So it basically means that this is the foundation on the basis of which the Supreme Court is able to derive a conclusion is what is called as ratio decidendi. So basically the judge would want to resolve this particular case. So he comes to a particular conclusion because of the evidence that is submitted, because of the documents that is shared, because of the oral submissions that are made and as a result he comes to a conclusion so the minute he comes to a conclusion it is also written on the judgment copy as well which is called as ratio decidendi so the foundation on which the interpretation of which the evidence because of which he is able to come to a conclusion reasons for the decision is what is called as ratio decidendi which is written on the judgment then what we have is the obiter dicta what is this obiter dicta while the Supreme Court is listening to a particular case, while the progress of the case is happening, we also have the Supreme Court judges who also make oral observation as well. They may make some comments as well and even before the judgment is made, they may also pass passing comments as well and at the same time, there might be few comments which they might have said while these proceedings are happening but it is not part of the written statements or it is not part of the actual intent or the reasons of the decision. Such is what is called as obiter dicta. So when it comes to the ratio decidendi, it is the basis on which the Supreme Court comes to a conclusion. It is written in format but when it comes to the obiter dicta, it is not the part of the main judgment but it is just the passing cloud it is the oral observations that are made by the Supreme Court of India so when we speak about the Supreme Court of India the Constitution has given a lot of responsibility to the Supreme Court of India and at the same time we also have something called as the judicial scrutiny what is this judicial scrutiny when we speak about judicial scrutiny we have something called as the open court proceedings so whenever there is open court proceedings you also have the judiciary which is also being watched by the people that is how accountability of the judiciary is held as well so whenever the judiciary is speaking something its words will have stronger impact as well so when it is having stronger impact the judiciary will also have to be careful at the same time as well so this article currently goes on to say that when it comes to ratio decidendi it is the written part when it comes to the written part in this specific case the court did not have any wordings with respect to this particular case whatever criticism with respect to the spokesperson was made was only oral submission it was not part of the written statement as well and when we consider article 141 of the Indian Constitution it says law declared by Supreme Court to be binding on all courts the law declared by the Supreme Court shall be binding on all courts within the territory of India and when we speak about article 141 it basically looks into the ratio decidendi and not obiter dicta so in this particular case the supreme court has made an oral argument and in the past we have justice dy chandra chud in the chief election commissioner of india versus mr vijay baskar and others case stated language both on the bench and in judgment must comport with the judicial proprietary judicial language is a window to conscious sensitive to the constitutional ethos bereft of its understated balance language risk losing its symbolism as a protector of human dignity so whatever judgments the supreme court is writing or the high court 
is writing it should also be in sync with the oral submission as well now when it comes to this particular case as we have seen from this particular judgment oral observations are an integral part of the judicial process as well strong words which have the potential to prejudice the case should not have been spoken as a result some of the advocates also say that supreme court whenever it is using harsh words strong words which are part of the oral observation should also be in sync with the ratio decidendi in this specific case the ratio decidendi did not make a mention of any of it but it gave a oral submission but this oral submission should also be in line with the judgments as well since the oral submission is not in line with the judgment the supreme court may have used strong words which is not in sync with the judicial property so in the past we have also had judgments which went on to say that judges have the absolute and unchallengeable control of the court domain but they cannot misuse their authority by intemperate comments undignified banter or scathing criticism of the counsel parties or witnesses a two judge bench of the supreme court said in the case of am mathur versus pramod kumar gupta so in this particular case if the supreme court felt that there was person who was vitiating the environment yes it has every right to criticize but choice of word matters is what is another view point so the judges might be right in observing that the leaders often resort to controversies to advance their own political or nefarious agendas but this should be written in the right way the choice of words should be right is an other aspect to this article so on one side when we are speaking about social media the social media yes it has to be regulated if it is about fair criticism of the supreme court of india or the judiciary with respect to a judgment it is good but if it is about threatening the judges in such case the law enforcement agencies will have to put these people be in the past that's the first one the second is about the words that are being used by the supreme court we have the ratio decidendi which is what is part of the judgment we have obiter dicta which is nothing but the oral observation so the written part and the oral part have to be in sync if the wordings that are given on the oral observation is too strong then words will have to be correctly used by the supreme court is what is this article all about it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into the next article this article says fishing in uncertain waters the article here is speaking about the problems that are faced by the fishing community in kerala when we speak about kerala the coastal waters of kerala are having abundance of fish and the state is widely recognized as one of the largest fish consuming and exporting states of our country but for the past few years what we are witnessing is dwindling catch in kerala which has put people into poverty and number of people have also lost their livelihood means and mechanisms in this particular backdrop first we will understand why fishes or their numbers have dwindled for the past few years we will also try and understand what are the measures that have to be taken when we look into why fishes catch have reduced the first major factor that we have to look into is the climate change climate change might have already activated a vicious circle putting coastal ecosystems under stress and its impact is reflected in the catch and the composition in many parts the increasing presence of the cyclones and low pressure areas in the arabian sea is another major threat along with the number the duration is also on the rise as well while the number of cyclones has increased by 52% in the arabian sea the time they spend over the sea has increased by 80% between 2001 and 2019 the ocean absorbs 93% of the heat due to global warming and the oceanic conditions often influence cyclonic circulations and the monsoon winds so the first major issue is because of the climate change so because of the climate change what exactly is happening there are increasing cases of cyclones so when 
whenever there are increasing cases of the cyclones, what exactly happens? This fishing community is advised not to venture into the sea. So the number of days that they can enter the sea is actually getting reduced as well. Let's say hypothetically for a particular year, if you consider all the cyclones that are present in the Arabian Sea, let's say it is about 60 days. But what would happen? Because of the climate change, this 60 days is increasing to about 90 or 100 days and as a result, these fishermen community are not able to venture into the sea for another extra 40 days which means on a whole they are not able to enter into the sea for about 100 days in the earlier scenario it was about 60 days but because of the climate change because of the cyclones because these people are advised not to enter into the sea now the number of days that they would be able to enter the sea has comparatively reduced which means they have lost their livelihood means and mechanism as well this is one of the reasons as to why they are not able to generate enough catch and this is the first major concern the second is the El Nino Southern Oscillation causes rise in the surface temperature and triggers changes in the ocean's vertical thermal structure particularly in the coastal region and as a result what exactly happens according to the Centre Marine Fisheries Research Institute warming of the seawater due to this particular process has also depleted the stocks of number of fishes as well and at the same time because there is this particular concern changes in the temperature number of fish either lose out on their lives and at the same time they may also move into different coastal regions as well so whenever there is surface sea temperature which is increasing this means there is change in the environment so whenever the fish is acclimatized to a particular environment it also knows a particular temperature existing in that environment if the temperature changes all of a sudden it will not be able to sustain this temperature either it will start moving to a different region or number of fishes may also dwindle over a period of time so the second major problem is that there will be massive migration of some of these species to a different region so the change in the surface temperature is one of the reasons for their absence in the coastal water and as a result the oxygen minimum zones are increasing in the Arabian Sea as well so that is why the catches are dwindling is the second one the third major issue is with respect to the skate nets catch juvenile fish what do we mean by it? Skate nets are nothing but the sign nets. These are the nets which have the smallest mesh. So what exactly happens when we speak about the nets? There are different kinds of nets. But there are people who are using the smallest mesh. And as a result, you also have small fishes as well, which are getting locked up in these nets. And this, when it is pulled out, these are the juvenile fishes which needs to grow. It comes to a healthy condition and only then we are supposed to catch it but now we are even catching the juvenile fishes as well that is the younger fishes as well they have still not grown and this also means that there is no sustainable fishing that is happening in this part so the major reason being they are using these skate nets which means they have a smallest mesh this should not have been used but they are going on using these meshes so this catches the juvenile fish as well and it ultimately means it it is the sustainable fishing which is not working out. So these take nets also catch juvenile prawns, clams and every other fish species from the river as well as the seas and ultimately there is no sustainable fishing. If you consider the commissions that have been appointed in Kerala in the past, these commissions have been appointed to check unscientific and improper fishing practices along the Kerala coast. The commissions had also recommended banning the fishing nets with a mesh size below 28 mm but this has been largely ignored by the fishing community as well. Vembanad, which happens to be the Kerala's largest lake, for one, lost about 12.28 square kilometer between 1972 and 2015. Its depth too has decreased from sedimentation, reducing the water holding capacity by about 40%. So the state's water bodies are also shrinking. That is because of the developmental work that is happening along the lakes. So because of the developmental work added to it the state's water bodies are heavily contaminated by pesticides and industrial effluent so they in this particular region to prepare the agricultural fields to prepare the rice fields 
also make use of number of fertilizers pesticides as well this is also leading to killing of the fishes as well over exploitation and destructive practices seem to be other factors aggravating the situation so rampant deforestation intense agriculture activities industrialization pollution habitat destruction sand mining use of explosive and poison for fishing these are the other major threats as to why this particular fishing catch is dwindling their numbers are dropping and this is why people are suffering in the state of kerala and as a result they are not able to get enough number of fishes along the coastal water so they what do they do they start venturing deep into the sea as well and when they start venturing deep into the sea they have to invest a lot of time they have to invest a lot of fuel and at the same time they have to put in a lot of effort as well this basically means that many species like the sardine and so on and so forth are fast vanishing from the sea they were once available throughout the year but now what we have is these fishes which are not present because of all these activities of the human beings added to it if these people have to venture deep into the water what it also requires is a lot of money once these fishermen have to enter the sea they may have to invest let's say hypothetically about 50000 so even if they are investing 50000 they have to make profits right so they are not able to generate the profits because the catch that they are able to get is only giving them the revenue of about 40000 30000 so on and so forth and ultimately what it is resulting is in the form of losses so the income of fishermen in the state which depend on the fishing for their daily needs has drastically reduced and when you consider the fishermen it has become a risky trip as well why that is because you're not getting the fishes along the coastal water so they venture deep into the sea as well despite the cyclone warnings despite not having the right atmosphere to enter the deep sea they do enter and as a result they are losing their lives on one side they are not getting the required income there are number of fishes which are not present it is not able to meet up to the livelihood means and mechanisms added to all this they venture into the deep sea and because of which they are losing their lives kerala is slowly losing its relevance as a maritime state as well as the export hub as well kerala was once known for exporting a lot of fishes but now it is not the same and it is not able to export to multiple other countries kerala has nearly 50000 women working in the fishery sector and most of them are looking for alternative options so the situation is where the fisher women are also into this earlier they had engaged in fish vending and all the allied activities as well now they are also struggling to meet their ends as well so this basically means the women as well as men will have to give up on fishing will also look for opportunities elsewhere in some other field if you look into the statistics the fishery sector in kerala offers livelihood to nearly 15 lakh families and the catch is worth 40000 crore every year according to a study reported by the central marine fisheries research institute the kerala coast saw a massive fall in oil sardine catch in 2021 the total landings came down to 3297 tons registering a drop of 75% compared to 2020 this basically means the fishing community has become the major sufferer because of the dwindling catch in the arabian sea what are the measures taken by the government in the past the kerala government has imposed trawling ban during the monsoon season they were able to ensure that when the trawling ban is imposed it is only the traditional fishermen who would be able to enter into the deep sea as well as into the sea and get the catch as well but despite such measures it is not helping the traditional fishermen is another major issue so there has been a ban that has been imposed by the kerala government during the monsoon season this would be nearly for about 52 days so that there is sustainability of the fish but unfortunately despite imposing such bans as well it is not helping but this basically means there is a measure that is also taken by the kerala government added to it the kerala government on the recommendations of the fishery scientists as well as the fishers worker organization has also determined what is called as the minimal legal size 
This basically means that the mesh size should not be very less as we previously discussed. If the mesh size is very less, there will be number of catches, there will be juvenile fishes which will also be caught as well. This basically means the sustainability is not happening. So this article currently goes on to say that the minimum legal sizes for all these nets will also have to meet the intended standards as prescribed by the Kerala government. So it is high time that we shifted ourselves to sustainable fishing practices so that there is less biodiversity loss is what is this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article says IITM rank country's top higher education institute. According to the Ministry of Education's National Institute of Ranking Framework 2022, the Indian Institute of Technology Madras is yet again the top higher ranking institute in the country, followed by the Indian Institute of Science and third happens to be IIT Bombay. In this particular backdrop, we will try and understand what is this National Institute Ranking Framework. We will also understand what has been the ranking for the year 2022. When we speak about NIRF, this was launched in the year 2015. So this was launched by the Ministry of Human Resource Development back then and now it has become the Ministry of Education. This NIRF basically ranks colleges, universities, research institutions and also provides an overall ranking of all of them combined. This is an annual exercise and the framework allows an Indian approach where it considers India-centric parameters like diversity, inclusiveness apart from excellence in teaching, learning and research. The institutions for the year 2022 were ranked under 11 categories. Overall, University Colleges, Engineering, Management, Pharmacy, Law, Medical, Architecture, Dental as well as Research. While participation in the NIRF was voluntary in the initial years, it has now become compulsory for all the government run institutions from the year 2018. So initially it was voluntary but now it has become compulsory and this year 2022 happens to be the 7th consecutive edition of the NIRF. This is based on 5 important parameters. What are those? One is the teaching, learning and resources. This parameter checks the core activities in the education institutions. It basically looks at student strength including doctoral students, faculty student ratio, total budget and its utilization, combined metric for faculty with PhD experience, so on and so forth. Then we have the research and professional practice, which speaks about excellence in teaching and learning, which is closely associated with the scholarship. So these parameters attempt to measure the quantity and quality of research output as seen through the international databases. Then we have the graduation outcome, which tests the effectiveness of learning or the core teaching, where it measures the student's graduation rate their success in finding appropriate placement in industry and government or taking up the higher studies. Then we have the outreach and exclusivity which lays special emphasis on the representation of the women. It also looks into socially challenged persons as students. It also looks at outreach activities of the institution and this includes percentage of the women, economically and socially challenged students, facilities for the physically challenged students, region diversity, so on and so forth. Finally, what we have is the perception, which gives us the importance given to the perception of an institution. So the ranking methodology gives a significant importance even to the perception of the institute by its stakeholders and this will be accomplished by the stakeholder survey. So what is the importance of the NIRF? It would basically enable all the parents, students, teachers, educational institutions and other stakeholders who are working closely with the education sector to get an objective parameter and the transparent process about the ranking. So this will facilitate a level playing field in ranking all the institutions. But why did the government of India come up with such an initiative? We have one of the global rankings called as the QS and the Times Higher Education Rankings. None of the Indian colleges or the university figure in the top 100. So as a result, what the government decided is we also needed to have one of these rankings so that if we are coming up with such ones, they would be able to change as well. They would be able to bring a change in their structure as well 
so that these colleges ultimately come in the top 100 so the idea being that India did not have the ranking so we have to come up with the ranking so that we can boost the competition in the country and we would also be able to come up with the benchmark as well so the international rankings did not have any of the Indian colleges to give boost to the Indian colleges so that they also come in the top 100 and to establish a benchmark this was the necessity and which is why the government of India came up with NIRF for the year 2022 if we look into the top engineering colleges we have IIT Madras at top followed by IIT Delhi, IIT Bombay, Kanpur, Karakpur, Roorkee, Guwahati, Tiruchirapalli, NIT, IIT Hyderabad and NIT Suratkal. Top Universities, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Jamia Milia Islamia New Delhi, Jadavpur University, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Petam, Banaras Hindu University, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Calcutta University, Value Institute of Technology and University of Hyderabad. And when it comes to the top management colleges, Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad, IAMB, IAMC, Indian Institute of Technology Delhi, Indian Institute of Management Kolikot, Indian Institute of Management Lucknow, Indian Institute of Management Indoor, Xavier Labor Relations Institute, National Institute of Industrial Engineering and Indian Institute of Technology Madras. When it comes to the top law colleges, National Law University, Symbiosis Law School, Nalsar University of Law, West Bengal National University of Jurisdictional Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology Karakpur, Jamia Milia Islamia New Delhi, Gujarat National Law University, Siksha O Anusandan, National Law University, Jodhpur. These are some of the important colleges and when it comes to the medical colleges, All India Institute of Medical Sciences Delhi, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Christian Medical College, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences Bangalore, Banaras Hindu University, Jawaharlal Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education, Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Pitam, Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute for Medical Sciences and Technology and Kasturaba Medical College Manipal and when it comes to the NIRF overall category rankings we have Indian Institute of Technology Madras, Indian Institute of Science, Indian Institute of Technology Bombay, Indian Institute of Technology Delhi, Indian Institute of Technology Kanpur so on and so forth. So these are the rankings given under the NIRF 2022. This can be important from the preliminary examination point of view as well. Now let's look into the next article. This article says Assam Arunachal CM agreed to border realignment based on 1960 papers. When it comes to the Assam Arunachal Pradesh dispute, we have already recorded a video in one of our CNAs. The link for the same will also be given in the description box, so kindly look into it. To give you a brief gist of what the Assam and Arunachal Pradesh dispute is, there have been allegations of residents from one state encroaching land on the other state which have led to the disputes and violence. So a case was filed in the Supreme Court of India since the year 1989 as well and now in a bid to resolve all the border issues that have been present between Assam and Arunachal Pradesh, they have decided to form 12 regional committees which will be headed by the cabinet ministers. These committees will jointly verify the concerned villages. Thereafter, they will also make recommendations to the respective state governments, keeping in view the historical picture between Assam and Arunachal Pradesh, the administrative convenience, continuity as well as the people's will. So this committee will speak to the people in that particular area and this is what is called as the Namsai Declaration. Why is it called as Namsai Declaration? That is because this meeting was held in Namsai in Arunachal Pradesh. So as of now there are impediments, there are issues, there are obstacles between both these states. This will be fixed in the near future is what is this article all about. But what is important is for you to understand understand what is the differences, what are the main concerns between Assam and Arunachal Pradesh for which you can look into the description box. Now let's look into the main practice questions. Campaigns through social media are adversely impacting matters relating to law and constitution. Elaborate. Discuss the possible reasons for reduction in the fish catches in the Indian coast and suggest corrective measures. So please write all your answers on the comment section peer review and do give positive feedback to your friends answers. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.